he doesn't seem to me in Korchnoi's character to ever lose a game on purpose. Hello chess fans, this is Rick from Chess Stream Press, it's getting closer and closer. Only three weeks till the 2020 candidates tournament will kick off in Yekaterinburg in Russia. Round 1 will be played on Tuesday, March 17th. And on Chess to Impress I'll do a few videos as a countdown to get us all in the mood. These are the 8 players that will do battle. Top left is Wang Hao from China, he won the FIDE Grand Swiss. Next to him is Anish Giri who qualified by rating. Fabiano Kairana was the runner-up of the last World Championship match in 2018. He lost against Carlsen in a tie-break. Jan Nepomnishi, top right, qualified through the Grand Prix. Bottom right, Ding Liren, and next to him Timur Rajabov qualified through the World Cup. Alexander Grishuk won the Grand Prix and qualified as well. And a gentleman in the bottom left is the wildcard, Kirill Alexienko from Russia. In this video I will do a little historical overview of the candidates matches and candidates tournament through the ages. If you have seen that one already in my previous video on this topic, then you can skip to the game. I will show a game later in this video of the 1962 candidates tournament and I will put the timestamp of the start of that game up here. So you can skip to that one if you want or stay with me for this little historical overview. The tournament in London in 1883 was not really a candidates tournament, but Willem Steinis won it and Johannes Zuckertort was second and it was decided that those two players would play the first official match for the World Championship three years later. St. Petersburg in 1895 and 1896 was won by world champion Emmanuel Lasker. Willem Steinis finished in second place and he then gained the right to challenge Lasker for the world title. The tournament in the Netherlands in 1938 was won by Paul Keres and he gained the right to challenge world champion Alexander Aljechin, but he never got this match because World War II got in the way. The first official candidates tournament was held in Budapest in 1950 with a tiebreak match held in Moscow. David Bronstein won and challenged world champion Botvinnik. Zurich 1953 was won by Vasily Smyslov as well as Amsterdam 1956. In Yugoslavia in 1959, Misha Tal came out on top and it was his turn to challenge Botvinnik for the world title. Curaçao 1962 was won by Tigran Petrosian. I put it in red because we'll see a game from that tournament later. From then on, the candidates tournament turned into candidates matches. It was Bobby Fischer who felt that the Soviets were making too many short draws against each other to save energy for the games against the other players. So matches were played and Boris Paski came out on top. He won the final match in Tbilisi in 1965 and challenged Petrosian for the world title. He also won the candidates matches, finishing in Kiev in 1968 and he had his rematch against Petrosian, which he won. Bobby Fischer defeated Tigran Petrosian in Buenos Aires in 1971 and earned the right to challenge Spassky for the world title. Moscow 1974, Anatoly Karpov beat Viktor Korchnoi and because Fischer did not defend his title, Karpov became world champion. Korchnoi won Belgrade 1977 and 1978 and also Merano 1980-1981 to challenge Karpov for the world title. Both times he lost. And then the Kasparov era started. Vilnius 1984 was won by him and he challenged Karpov for the world title, which he won after many matches and many adventures. Karpov came back. He won against Andrei Sokolov in Linares 1987 to qualify for a fourth match against Kasparov. And in Kuala Lumpur 1990, Karpov again came out on top. He beat Jan Timan and qualified for match 5 against Kasparov. Nigel Short beat Karpov in the semi-finals and Timon in the finals in San Lorenzo de Elas Correal in 1993 to challenge Kasparov. Then the chess world was split up and I'm only showing here what happened with the classical world championship. Las Palmas 1995 was won by Anand. He challenged Kasparov in New York 1995. Kasorla 1998 was won by Shirov. It was a match between Shirov and Kramnik. Shirov won, but did not get a match. 
Kramnik did in the year 2000 and beat Kasparov. Dortmund 2002 was won by Peter Leko and he challenged Kramnik for the world title in 2004 and narrowly lost. 7-0 was the final score of that match. In 2007 a world championship tournament was held. Four players had to qualify and Levon Aronian, Boris Gelfand, Alexander Grishuk and Peter Leko came through those qualifiers. Anand went on to win the world championship tournament. Veselin Topalov beat Gata Kamsky in Sofia 2009 to qualify to challenge world champion Anand. And in Kazan 2011 it was Boris Gelfand's turn to challenge Anand for the world title. Then the Carlson era started. He won London 2013, challenged and beat Anand, who bounced back in Gantimansisk in 2014 to win a candidates tournament and qualified for a rematch against Carlson, which he then also lost. Moscow 2016, Sergei Karyakin came out on top and almost beat Carlsen in the world title match. As did Fabiano Carrana, who won the Canada's tournament in Berlin 2018 and also only lost to Carlsen in a tiebreak. And now 2020, who will it be? Almost everybody thinks that Carrana and Ding are the favorites. But what do you think? You can let me know in the comments. Back to this page, I put Curaçao 1962 in red because we're going to look at a game from that candidates tournament. It was a grueling event, a quadruple round robin, which means 28 games. Five players from the Soviet Union, Petrojan, Tal, Keres, Geller and Korchnoi. Two Americans, Fischer and Benko, and one player from Czechoslovakia, Filip. Mikhail Tal dropped out after 21 rounds and had to be hospitalized. Petrosian won the tournament and went on to challenge and defeat world champion Mikhail Botvinnik in 1963. And this is my all-time favorite chess picture. Mikhail Tal ignoring his breakfast in hospital. Bobby Fischer came to visit him. Bobby Fischer was the only participant who visited Tal in hospital. Let's play some chess. I'm going to show you a game from the 23rd round of this tournament. White is Tigran Petrosian. Black is Viktor Korchnoi. Both players were still in the running to win the event. It was played on the 16th of June 1962. And I'm using the analysis from Grandmaster Jan Timman in his book on the match. Petrosian opened with the C pawn. C5, the English opening. Knight f3, knight f6, d4, c takes, knight takes, g6, knight c3 and d5. And Timman calls this dubious. He says, with reverse colors, this setup is okay since the king's bishop has already been fianchettoed, although it won't yield any advantage then. But the missing tempo makes itself painfully felt. What Timon means is that the black bishop is not on g7 yet, which it would have been if this setup was played with colors reversed, then the white bishop would already be on g2, as white always has an extra move, and then it is playable, but not with black. Bishop g5 by Petrosian, the most energetic move, writes Timon, also played by Smyslov against Korchnoi in the USSR Championship in 1952, 10 years earlier. So Korchnoi had played this early d5 move before. Korchnoi took on c4, e3, and here Bishop g7 was played by Korchnoi in the game against Smyslov in 1952. But in this game he plays queen a5 and Timon calls that a risky move as black is neglecting his development. Bishop takes f6, of course, writes Timon. White gives up the bishop pair on the correct assumption that his king's bishop, this one, will become very strong. Korchnoi recaptured. Bishop takes c4, regaining the pawn. And bishop b4, and as Timon writes, this move is also part of Black's plan. But the plan just will not work out, as we'll see. Black is threatening to take on c3. He's attacking that with two pieces. It's only protected by the pawn. So rook c1 from Petrosian, dealing with the threat of bishop takes c3. And here, according to Timon, Black should have castled. Then white castles with the threat of knight d5. And Timon says this is also very unpleasant for black. But Korchnoi did not castle, he played a6. 
It was Jean Castled on pins is knight on c3, knight d7 developing, and here knight d5 is given by Timon. He says it seemed almost impossible not to go for knight d5, after which black is roughly facing the same uphill struggle as in the game. But a3 was Petrojan's choice instead, kicking the bishop. Timon says that bishop takes c3 is correct here, although it would do nothing to solve black's problems. He gives this variation, rook takes c3, then knight e5, attacking the bishop on c4, bishop drops back, black castles, and f4. And Timon says it's hard to see how black will manage to throw up a proper defensive line here. But after a3, Korchnoi did not take on c3, he went back to e7 with the bishop. Before hitting the queen, and the queen went to e5, where as we'll see it will be harassed further. Queen takes a3, taking that pawn is not playable because of knight d5, with devastating results, says Timon. And indeed, knight c7 is a threat, that will win the rook in the corner, also rook a1 is a threat that will win black's queen after queen b2 and rook a2. It's indeed devastating for black. So taking on a3 is not possible. Queen e5 was played and f4 forcing the queen back. You cannot take on e3 with check because after king h1 there are immediate fatal consequences for black, writes Timon. Well, you don't need any variations here. It's easy to see that White has all his pieces ready to attack Black's king, which is in the center. The queen is somewhat lost on e3. If the pieces are not developed, this is not playable for black. So after f4, the queen went back to b8. And here a very nice move from Petrosian. Bishop takes f7 check. A very nice sacrifice. The point is that it gives white control over the e6 square, explains Timon, as we'll see. Black took the piece, queen b3 check, if you go to g7 with the king there is knight e6 check, and after king h6 there is rook f3 and the black king is going to be checkmated very soon, writes Timon. So after queen b3 check, Korchnoi went back to e8 with the king, he lost his castling rights, but he has won a piece, how is white going to prove that this piece sacrifice was correct? Knight d5, that move was hanging in the air for a long time. Bishop d6 and knight e6. As Timon says, the white knight pair penetrates with devastating force. b5 from Korchnoi, knight d c7 check with a fork, king e7, and now knight d4. The final blow, says Timon. There's no defense, the engine is already on plus 5. King f8 was played by Korchnoi, but he resigned after knight takes a8. Why did he resign? If you take back on a8, then there is queen e6, and black's position would have collapsed like a house of cards, writes Timon. For starters, the bishop is hanging. It can't go to c7, because then the rook takes. It can't go to b8, because then this bishop will be unprotected. So it has to go to e7. And then there is knight c6, attacking the bishop again, and it cannot be defended a second time. And it has no safe squares to go to, so that bishop will be lost. After queen e6, you can also not play queen b8 to protect the bishop, because then there is knight c6 as well, hitting the queen. And after queen c7, saving the queen and keep the bishop protected, there is knight e7, attacking the queen, and attacking bishop c8 twice with the knight and through the queen also with the rook and it's all too much to defend for black. So after knight takes a8, Korchnoi resigned and Petrosian had won an important game on his way to winning the event. A very poor game from Korchnoi and I have to read you from Timon's book. People speculated that Korchnoi had lost this game on purpose and it is true that at the first glance the course of the game would justify such dark suspicions. In reality, however, games in which one of the players has been bribed, although bribery isn't even the correct word here as no money had changed hands, look quite different. 
A well-known example is Taimanov against Matulovic in Palma da Mallorca 1971. Matulovic would get $400 if he lost. He arrived late in the playing hall, played rapidly and poorly and read the newspaper in between moves. It's an entirely different thing to be beaten so painfully and comprehensively as in this game between two rivals who, in principle, had a beating of each other. I also think that this is not the only reason why we needn't doubt Korchnoi's words, that he had not understood the opening system properly. Strangely enough, he occasionally met with similar catastrophes in his later career, for example when he lost in 18 moves against the Spanish master Ricardo Calvo during the Havana Olympiad of 1966. So Timon does not think that Korchnoi threw this game, and I also would be very surprised. It doesn't seem to me in Korchnoi's character to ever contemplate that, let alone lose a game on purpose. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you will keep building up towards the candidates tournament with me. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, please subscribe to the Chess to Impress channel and please leave a comment. I will read them all and I will reply to them all. If you liked this video, it would be great if you could share it on social media by clicking the share button on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter and on Facebook. This is Rick for Chess to Impress. Thank you for watching.